ان الحمد لله ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القران المجيد والفرقان الحميد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ما لكم لا ترجون لله وقارا وقد خلقكم اطوارا وقال النبي صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم ادبني ربي فاحسن تاديبي او كما قال عليه الصلاه والسلام Honorable scholars, respected brothers and elders, there is no stage in the life of a human and in particular in the life of a believer that he can become complacent with his progress and his achievement. In essence, the effort to better ourselves, to improve ourselves is unending. It is a lifelong effort. وَعْبُدْ رَبَّكَ حَتَّى يَأْتِيَكَ الْيَقِينَ Allah says, and continue worshipping your Allah until death overpowers you. And really speaking, when a person has the passion and the desire to better himself, to improve himself, then wallahi he will learn from all circumstances, whether positive or negative. Everything will leave him impressed. Someone said it very beautifully in English, a positive thinker finds an opportunity in every difficulty. And a negative thinker finds a difficulty in every opportunity. Let me repeat that. A positive thinker finds an opportunity in every difficulty. And a negative thinker finds a difficulty in every opportunity. Sayyidina Luqman alayhi salatu was salam. Allah devotes one chapter of the Quran to Luqman alayhi salam. Subhanallah. And from the many advisors that he had disseminated, Allah selected few and Allah gave it place in the Quran. Ya bunayya aqimi salata wa amur bil ma'roof wa anha anil munkar. Wasbir ala ma asabak. إِنَّ ذَٰلِكَ مِنْ عَزْمِ الْأُمُورِ Oh my son, establish salah. Invite towards good. Forbid from evil. And persevere what comes your way. وَلَا تُسَعِرْ خَدَّكَ لِلنَّاسِ And do not be unpleasant and hostile towards people. وَلَا تَمْشِ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَحَا And do not be arrogant on the earth. Someone asked Luqman, Luqman, you are so wise. You are so famous. Where did you get it all from? Where did you learn mannerism from? And that's what I want to speak on today. Manners, etiquettes, code of conduct. Where did you learn it from all? He said, I learned it from those who lack it. <coughs> Where did you learn manners from? I learned it from those who lack it. People said, can you elaborate? What do you mean? He said, every time I seen someone doing wrong and evil, I said, that looks wicked. That looks despicable. That's so unpleasant. So that is what I must avoid. So that is what I must avoid. If it looks wicked to me when he does it, I guess it will look wicked to others when I do it. So as I looked at the flaws of people, I kept on learning and improving and bettering myself. Now on the reverse, you and I, when we see the faults and the flaws of others, we latch on to it and there goes the propaganda. So we don't learn from the whole thing. We don't learn from the whole thing. We will say, this man, you know, he's in authority and he abuses his authority. Only to know the day Allah puts me in authority, I'm worse than the one that said before me. So we are not learning. What did Luqman salam say? I learned from those who lack manners. That is where I learned it. The Prophet wasallam said, Addabani Rabbi fa'ahsana ta'deebi. My Allah molded me. My Allah fashioned me. And my Allah taught me manners. And my Allah left nothing, un- my, my Allah left nothing short. In molding me, in tutoring me, in teaching me, my Allah left nothing short. Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu, it is said that unfortunately we haven't studied the language of the Qur'an because of which we have been barred from volumes of Islamic knowledge. So you cannot appreciate the couplets of Ali radiallahu anhu wa arba and you cannot comprehend what he had condensed in his poetry and conveyed to the masses. There is a kitab exclusive to the poetry of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu amongst which I share something relevant to our topic he said, لَيْسَ الْجَمَالُ بِأَثْوَابٍ تُزَيِّنُنَا لَيْسَ الْجَمَالُ بِأَثْوَابٍ تُزَيِّنُنَا إِنَّ الْجَمَالَ جَمَالُ الْعَقْلِ وَالْأَجَبِ 
It is not beautiful clothes and exclusive homes that adorn us and beautify us, but rather it is a good conduct and mannerism that adds value to human life. ليس اليتيم الذي قد مات والده He alone is not an orphan whose biological parent has died before he reached the age of puberty. He too is an orphan who sees the presence of both his parents but devoid of mannerism and conduct. إن اليتيم يتيم العلم والأدب And if you explore on this definition of yatims, I'm afraid this world has become full of orphans. It is a world of orphans. There isn't any parent left. When you analyze orphan under the definition of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So really, if mannerism will come, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ad-deenu kulluhu adab. Another name of religion is manners. And Islam in, 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 in different words is respect, conduct, there are certain things that Allah has instilled in the human. A child is born, Allah has put it inborn into him that I don't call my mother by her name, it's just respectful. Allah has inherently put that into the human being. But unfortunately today, respect has been defeated totally. Now there are certain codes of conduct that we ought to display to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, respect to the being of Allah. Then there is respect to the symbols of Allah, be it the Quran, be it the house of Allah, be it the Kaaba of Allah. There is respect to the Prophet wasallam, respect to seniority, the senior people amongst us, and it continues. Let us first briefly look at the level of respect that we owe to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Ayat al-Karima that I recited, Allah said, مَا لَكُمْ لَا تَرْجُونَ لِلَّهِ وَقَارَ What is the matter with you? You show no regard for your Allah. You show no regard for your Allah. And again, when we want to understand the code of conduct of respect, be it between us and Allah, or between man and man, our point of reference, like always, is the prophets. Our point, this is also an important issue, we need to remind ourselves that our point of reference for navigation are the prophets. So when I look for guidance, when I look for solace, when I look for options, I've got to look at the lives of the Anbiya, and that's about it. So what does Allah teach us regarding the life of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam? When he presented before the tyrant king, and he wants to introduce Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he introduces his creator in the following way. الَّذِي خَلَقَنِي فَهُوَ يَهْدِينَ وَالَّذِي هُوَ يُطْعِمُنِي وَيَسْقِينَ وَإِذَا مَرِضْتُ فَهُوَ يَشْفِينَ My Allah is the one who has created me, hence he guides me. My Allah is the one who nourish me, and hence he sustains me. And perchance when I become sick, he is kind enough to cure me. Now the ulama elaborate on this point. It is an article of our faith that just as prosperity comes from Allah, adversity also comes from Allah. وَالْقَدْرِ خَيْرِهِ وَشَرِّهِ Good and bad comes from Allah. Had Ibrahim alayhi salam said, Allah makes me sick and Allah cures me, he committed no crime. But look at the inborn respect in the heart of a Nabi for his Allah. He did not choose to attribute sickness to Allah simply because it gave off an external flavor of unpleasantness. So he opted to say, when I become sick, he is kind enough to cure me. That is respect to the being of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the ideal situation. Mine's and your situation is the most tragic situation. It is the most tragic situation. So what do we do is... We attribute adversity to Allah, we attribute it. There is a calamity, there is sickness, there is a tragedy. Allah knows best, if Allah wants to test, make dua. Allah knows best why He sends this on whom He sends it. So that is totally from Allah, that is the expression. But when it comes to prosperity, the minimum we can do, if we don't have the gesture of Ibrahim, then let's at least have the decency to say, when adversity comes from him, then let even let us attribute prosperity towards him. And wallah, there is the definition of a loyal servant. Let me ask you, my brother, you have sons, I have Allah, give our children hidayat. If my child speaks of me, someone says, who's your father? The one who beats me. The one who's always chanting and angry with me. The one who denies me my, my privileges. The one uh, who got upset with me. And that is, which is, which is correct. But obviously it's a half side. Uh, if my son goes around introducing me in this way, or your son does that to you, what would happen to your heart regarding your son? 
Have you and I not become a victim in this disrespect towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And let me leave you on this note by saying, I ask you, my brother, do you judge Allah by what He has given you, or are you still judging Him on what He hasn't given you? This is respect to the being of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So ideally we attribute prosperity towards Allah. Sayyidina Ayyub alayhi salatu was salam. Really it takes the heart of a Nabi, it takes the bosom of a Nabi, and it takes the discipline of a Nabi to say what is to be said. Sayyidina Ayyub was tested by Allah. Tested how the roof of his house caved in, causing the instant death of his children that were 14 in number causing the loss of everything. Then he developed an illness and a sickness. His wife then tells him, don't you think it's high time you now ask Allah to solve matters here. The tunnel is darkening, the night is getting darker, instead of raining, it's pouring. Those are the phrases people would use against Allah, against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ayyub alayhi salatu was, look at respect to Allah. He says that my Allah gave me the privilege of prosperity for 80 years. And my Allah has only tested me for 80 years. Respect demands that I patiently endure till 80 years lapse. Respect demands that from me. I, I, I can't expect otherwise. But the wife continuously exhorts him that make dua, make dua. So he said, no problem my wife, I will make dua. But I will not trespass the limits of respect when I speak to my Allah. So the Quran quoted his dua. What was his dua? You and I go through, you know, you cannot even make a comparison in our problem to that problem. There's no comparison. And then we hysterical and then we, we entertain negative thoughts about Allah. Negative thoughts about Allah. We start questioning our Iman. Allah, why me? Allah, how come this? My brother, if I look in my life and you look in your life, there's enough explanation to why these things are happening. There's too many explanations. But nonetheless, what is the respect to Allah? Rabbi anni masani al-dhur wa anta arhamur rahimeen. This is the height of respect. Allah, I have been afflicted and you are the most kind. Nothing more. Allah, remove my sickness. Allah, substitute my difficulties. Allah, bring joy. No, no. Allah, I am in pain and you know all. That's respect to a Nabi. That's the respect he shows to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah was so impressed that despite his situation warranting, making dua to Allah, moaning and groaning, crying and lamenting, but the manner and the respect with which he presented his case, Allah responded with three words in the Quran. Allah said, Inna wajadna hu sabira. Inna wajadna hu sabira. What a privilege. May Allah show His choicest blessings on Ayyub alayhi salam. Allah said, Inna wajadna husabira. We sanction His steadfastness. We are giving Him the certification of patience. We endorse it. Ni'mal abdu. Again, I wish you knew Arabic. How am I going to translate ni'mal abd? In the most simplified, closest possible, ni'mal abd means... Allah is saying, a brilliant servant of mine's indeed. I wish we can have that once from Allah. Really, I have said it and I cry in my du'as and I say it. You can say it to me, my brother. Someone else can say it to you, but it cuts no eyes. This is Allah saying it direct to Ayyub. This has all the credit that it you need. This has all the recognition that it needs. It's direct from Allah. It's approved by Allah. Innahu Awab. He turns to me constantly. But that's not all. Look at the condition of a Nabi. Allah speaks of Khidr alayhi salatu was salam in the Quran. We know the famous incident, the boat that was sailing. And this was by the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And just as Allah sends prophets and Allah, you know, designates certain tasks to them, likewise there are certain people with whom Allah familiarizes them with his hidden secrets. So the lifespan of this man, the death of this man, the decline of this dominion, the prosperity of this individual. And accordingly, Allah had told Khidr salam that this man will be sailing on this boat. And ahead, there is a tyrant king that wishes to snatch this boat. So you go and defect the boat. Obviously, the defecting of the boat was to, in, to, to cause minimum difficulty to save him from greater difficulty. Because the tyrant king would only snatch the boat if it was intact. 
And if it had any flaw or any defect, then he would consider it below his dignity. So Khidr went to the boat, boarded the boat, took a, a, a ride with this person, a cruise, and then when he disembarked, then he defected the boat. And then he narrated the whole tale to Musa alayhi salam. But again, look at the respect of a Nabi. When he made reference to the defecting of the boat, which was done by the command of Allah, he opted for the words, فَأَرَدْتُ أَنْ أَعِيبَهَا فَأَرَدْتُ أَنْ أَعِيبَهَا I by myself went and defected the boat. And he did not say, Allah commanded me to defect it. What did he say? Allah was kind enough to save him from the calamity that was coming ahead. So the command of Allah, this was a plan instituted by Allah. This was a strategy put forward by Allah. But he attributed the defecting of the boat to himself. And then furthermore, he straightens the wall to preserve the treasures of those young children. So this obviously had an element of kindness and absolute mercy. He said, فَأَرَادَ رَبُّكَ أَنْ يَبْلُغَ it was the kind intention, the noble endeavor of your merciful Allah to preserve the treasures of those orphans. And hence, by the will of Allah, I straightened this wall. I defected the boat, he attributed it to himself. What I'm saying is, unfortunately, today we have become yatim, like Sayyidina Ali said. Someone said, another couplet of Ali radiallahu anhu comes to mind. He said, Innamal fata man yaquluha anadha, wa laysal fata man yaqulu kana abi. Talented is the boy who can present with conduct and mannerism. He is talented and skilled. And there's no credit to the one who has no respect. And he says, my late father was like this, and my late grandfather was this, and I come from this social standing. What does that do? What manners do you have? Your father, your grandfather, your lineage, your family, your ancestry. They had all the nobility, but what do you reflect? إِنَّمَا الْفَتَى مَنْ يَقُولُهَا أَنَذَا Indeed, he is talented who has manners by himself. Then we look at respect to the symbols of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One is the house of Allah, the Kaaba of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The grandson of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, Salim rahmatullahi was making tawaf on the mataf. And the king of that time, Hisham ibn Abdul Malik came to him. So he said, Salim, nice to meet you. Those days the kings also kept a degree of contact uh, between themselves and the scholars. So he said, if you have any need, please let me know. It will be my privilege to help you in any way possible. So Salim Rahmatullah gave him an unpleasant gaze and he said, How dare! The height of disrespect! I stand at the Kaaba of Allah and I present my need to someone other than Allah. This is the height of disrespect. Anyway, the king realized his mistake. After they complete the tawaf and the circumambulation and they leave from the Kaaba and they exit from the Haram, the king again comes running to him and said, My, my apologies, my apologies. But really the offer still stands. The offer still stands. Anything you need, let me know. So Salim Rahmatullah said, when you say anything, are you referring to material needs or spiritual needs? He said, listen, spiritual needs, I think I have to learn from you more than I can convey to you. But materially speaking, there's nothing you will ask I won't able to put on your table. So look at these people. Salim Rahmatullah said, just for the record, let me tell you, material needs I haven't even asked Allah. Where am I going to ask you? I haven't even, uh, I, I, don't, I consider the world too trivial for me to engage dua for that. I consider it too insignificant a need. I had greater needs in my life. I have more things to do. I need my great thing to be sorted out. I don't know how I'm going to fare before my Allah. This world is too trivial a need for me to present before. Where am I going to put it before you? There is respect to the being of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah speaks about the Quran. لا يمسه إلا المطهرون None can touch the Qur'an but the pure. The famous incident of Sayyidina Ali when he was about to accept, Sayyidina Umar about to accept Islam. And he beat his, 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 his sister and his brother-in-law. And then he was about to touch the Qur'an but his sister said, Listen Umar, whatever you want to do, you can do. But there is the word of Allah. You will have to tramp over my dead body before you touch the word of my Allah. You go and take a bath, then you come and touch Qur'an. That is the symbol of my Allah. How sad a sight. Allah be my witness, my heart cries, my heart cries. When I walk into a Muslim house, and I must see the devil box, and the most pornographic material displayed, and one side Allah on this wall, and one side Muhammad on that wall, and the Quran here, and the Kitab here, is this not the height of disrespect to Allah and the symbols of Allah? Zulaikha, the minister's wife, who intended seducing Yusuf and soliciting Yusuf alayhi salam, 
before she advanced with the nasty motive. She picks a cloth and she drops it over something. Yusuf asks her, listen, I cannot come close to you, but what have you done? She said, that's my idol I have. I feel ashamed to commit a wrong in front of my idol. An inanimate, lifeless object, but conscious of this woman. Her, her degree, her guilt bothers her. What has happened to the Muslim of today? How many youngsters, that very tasbih, that very musabbiha, on which Allah's name is taken, is vibrating because of him blasting his music? Respect to the symbols of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does the Quran say? وَمَن يُعَظِّمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ وَمَن يُعَظِّمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ Allah says, a reflection of the piety of your heart is how much you respect anything and everything that gives off an image or gives off a reflection of Allah's name. To the extent and in proportion, in proportion to how much value and sanctity you attach to anything that has Allah's name upon it. Accordingly, there is a reflection of how much fear you have of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So really speaking, there is the first level of respect towards Allah. Allah favor us with that true respect. Then we look at the respect to the noble personality of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anhu asked one sahabi, Are you older or is Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam older? He said, Huwa akbaru minni wa ana asannu minhu. Look at the, the sensitivity with which that I am older than Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but let me remind you, he is elder than me. I am older than him, but he is elder than me. Nabi alayhi salatu was salam in the fatal illness, in his fatal illness, there were about 17 salah that he could not physically perform due to his uh, circumstances and his health. So he had indicated to Abu Bakr that Abu Bakr lead the congregation. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu commences the salah, and when the salah commences, from his blessed room, the curtain opens, uh, there is movement, there is shuffle, there is a degree of movement in the congregation that the Prophet sallallahu is been escorted and he's been brought, brought forward. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, from his musalla, leading the congregation, starts retreating through to, and starts moving backwards. After the salah was, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then motioned him with his hand and his gesture, that continue, continue. After the salah was over, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called Abu Bakr, and he said, Abu Bakr, what was the matter during salah I seen you started moving back? He said, oh Nabi of Allah, I, I perceived that you were coming forward, مَا كَانَ لِبْنِ أَبِي قُحَافَةً مَا كَانَ لِبْنِ أَبِي قُحَافَةً أَنْ يُصَلِّي بَيْنَ يَدَيْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ sallallahu alayhi wa sallam it does not behove the personality of Abu Bakr, the son of Abu Quhafa. It just doesn't look correct. It's just not on. It's just not ethical that I lead a salah and my Nabi is behind me in the congregation. This was respect. In fact, not that. There is a hadith in Bukhari and in Muslim Sharif. Two Sahaba, Fudayla ibn Ubaid al-Aslami, and another Sahabi by the name of Ibn al-Wara radiyallahu anhuma, they are practicing archery. So the bow and the arrow and they practice in Nabi Alayhi Salaam happens to pass by. He was a unique man. He pets them both. And he says, Irmu Bani Ismail, fa inna abakum kana ramia. MashaAllah, brilliant, go for it, practice it. Really, ancest your, your, your ancestor, that is Sayyidina Ismail was a great archer. So excel in archery. And then Nabi Alayhi Salaam, just to add a bit of flavor, he said, okay, I am on the side of Ibn Wara. So Fudayla, it's me and Ibn Wara and you are on that side. He dropped his arrow down. He said, don't be over life, you're on that side, then I can't challenge. Respect demands differently. If you stand on, how, how can I be challenging you? It's just not on. How can I be challenging? This is the respect. This is the level of respect that they showed for the Prophet wasallam. Really, I can speak much more. I just want to touch on to one, two other aspects. Respect towards seniority. Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam has taught us, today you see how youngsters speak to elderly people, it is a painful sight. It is so hurting, it is so distasteful. When you see a youngster snubbing any elder, there was a time that you respected every senior man, regardless of his faith, and that is the teachings of Islam. In the min ijlalillahi ta'ala, respecting Allah demands, you respect the one that carries the word of Allah. I know of a very good friend of mine, an elderly person, he will never sit in the front of the car if there is a hafiz in the car. He, he will never, if that hafiz is 15 years old, he will make sure that boy sits in front, whether he sits and plays with his phone or does anything. But he says, he's got the word of Allah, and I said, how, how can I stretch my legs towards him? 
Demand respecting to Allah demands you respect the one who carries the word of Allah. And you equally respect the elderly of society. Nabi alayhi salam says in the hadith of Muslim Sharif, I mean, if this respect becomes common, wallah, life will become pleasant. Nabi alayhi salam said, in a dream I seen I was making miswak. Faja'ani rajulan. Two people came to me. Faddafa'tuhu ila al-asghar. So I took the miswak and I gave it to the younger of the two. And then I was told in my dream, Kabbir, Kabbir, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, don't give it to that young one, give it to the senior first. So in my dream, I was also inspired that there's recognition to seniority. There is recognition to the seniors of society. Unfortunately, today this has become absent. We have also been taught respect in the manner in which we dress, the manner in which we present ourselves. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was returning from a battle, and then he told his Sahaba, إِنَّكُمْ قَادِمُونَ عَلَىٰ إِخْوَانِكُمْ فَأَصْلِحُوا لِبَاسَكُمْ وَرِحَالَكُمْ حَتَّى تَكُونُوا كَأَنَّكُمْ شَمَّةٌ فِي النَّاسِ Since you return in, return yourself. Present yourself so that you look decent. Allah doesn't like shabbiness and neither does Allah like vulgarity. How beautiful a religion. How beautiful. One group came to Nabi alayhi salam. Everybody came hastening. One man was very calm, very disciplined, very dignified. He arranged everything, then he came. Nabi alayhi salam says, I observed your nation, I observed your tribe. Allah was very impressed how systematic and how many you are. Allah loves that. Now I come to a critical point and I end on this note. What is the level of respect? Two things. One is between, our hus between husband and wife. Islam teaches us, and don't get me wrong please. Islam teaches us that a wife ought to respect her husband. A wife ought to obey her husband. These are the words of the hadith of Nabi alayhi salatu wa salam. Al-mar'atu idha sallat khamsaha wa samat shahraha wa ata'at ba'laha. When a woman obeys her husband. And Islam teaches us that a husband respects his wife. If you study hadith, then you will understand what I'm saying. We have not been taught that a husband obeys his wife. I'm not saying disobey. What I'm saying is Islam encourages us to respect. So in our differences also, if we show respect to one another, then we will able to objectively communicate. But if we trespass the limits of respect, then I'm afraid too much is thrown out and then it becomes difficult to digest. And the point that I want to speak about, what is the level of respect in the midst of differences? Difference of opinion is inevitable. It happened from Sahaba to Tabi'in coming right down. And I often say and I advocate this, the definition of the unification of this nation is not consensus on one view. Simply because if, if anybody has a motive to unite the Ummah by bringing them onto consensus, then I'm afraid it's a losing battle. Because to start off, that's not the definition of unity. The Sahaba were the most united, yet they were diverse. And like we always say, is the healthy democracy in politics. If there is diversity, it's a healthy democracy. Sahaba had differences, but they respected the differences. The very death of Nabi alayhi salam caused differences. Abu Bakr said he passed away. Umar said he did not pass away. Then the issue came about, where is he buried? Someone said Jannatul Baqi, someone said there. Abu Bakr said, no. Ma qubidha nabiyun illa dufina haythu qubidha. I heard him saying a prophet is buried where he passes away. And then the issue came about the nomination of a leader. So the muhajirin said, minna amirun wa minkum amir. We want a leader, you have a leader. Just difference of opinion. So this happened amongst them continuously. Abu Bakr and Umar were the greatest leaders in, in Islam. Yet there were difference of opinion on so many rulings. Abu Bakr radiallahu was the opinion, was of the opinion that the land that is conquered by the Muslims comes, falls under the booty and must be distributed. Sayyidina Umar said, no, no, that is waqaf land. That belongs to Allah. And Abu Bakr distributed according to his vision, Umar distributed according to his vision. So there was difference of opinion, but the hearts were not divided. The Quran says, وَلَوْ شَاءَ رَبُّكْ لَجَعَلَ النَّاسَ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا وَلَا يَزَالُونَ مُخْتَلِفِينَ If Allah wanted, He could have united everyone, but differences are meant to happen. So this will happen. As long as the hearts do not differ, then we are prospering as a nation. We can end off from a meeting, we can be... Heated as far as difference of opinion, but we can greet one another with the cleanliness of the heart. So when Abu Bakr radiallahu was in the throes of death, and he said, I made Umar in charge. People told him, Abu Bakr, before you take your last breath, listen, you're making a man who was stern with us when you were alive. Now you're gone in a free range. His reins will be open. What's going to happen to us? How will you answer Allah? He said, if Allah asks me, I will tell Allah, I nominated the best of your creation. And say that to Umar, that is what I have to say. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and Umar radiallahu had a difference. 
Umar radiallahu anhu was of the opinion that if an adulterer and an adult, adulteress, they committed adultery and then they got married, then the second legal, they, they entered into wedlock. The first will be forbidden. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, a very great Sahabi, he was, he was adamant on the opinion that if you committed adultery and then you got married, you still remain in adultery with that person. <laughs> they differed on their opinion, but they had respect. One person came to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he said, I want to learn Quran and I've learned some from Umar. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, if you learned it from me, don't embarrass me by learning from me. If you learn from Umar, what can I teach you? This was the respect despite the differences. One, two incidents and I end with this here, respect in the hearts of differences. So we can have differences, but this ummah needs to, the hearts have to be united. The battle of Jamal is a very, very sad episode in the annals of Islamic history. It was a very contentious issue and it led to internal unrest. It led to uh, anarchy to a great extent. And it indulged uh, eminent scholars on both sides. And it triggered by uh, the uh, avenging the death of Sayyidina Uthman. There was difference of opinion. It was then exploited by certain elements. And it resulted in a bloody war. And it is known as Jamal simply because Aisha radiallahu got onto her camel to try and bring some normality. These were the differences and both sides were eminent, eminent sahaba. And we should not open our tongue. These were great people. The Quran said, Afallahu anhum, Allah had forgiven them. Someone came to Ali radiallahu anhu and he said, Listen, these people in the battle of Jamal that fought against you. So what's your opinion? Are they polytheists? He said, never. He said, are they, are they, uh, are they hypocrites? He said, never. He said, what would you call them, infidels? He said, never. So he asked Ali, then what would you call your oppositions, your opponents? He said, they are our brothers who differed with us. They are our brothers who differed with us. So after the battle of Jamal, Ali radiallahu goes to the house of Talha, and he says, how are you doing? How's your father? How's the family? Someone says, you fight with the man's father in the battle, and now you come and ask him about these family matters. He said, listen, there is a difference of opinion, but our hearts are united. I make dua to Allah every day, that Allah has said, before the dwellers of Jannah will enter into Jannah, I will cleanse their heart of the malice that is there. I hope from Allah that myself and your father will stand at the door of Jannah, and Allah will cleanse the malice that we have, and we both will enter into Jannah. So really, that is what we call for, respect in the heart of differences. Amongst the jurors also, Imam Shafi rahmatullahi, Imam Abu Hanifa, their, their vision was different and we respect their madhab very diligently. But this was not to divide the ummah. And this is the propaganda of the nasty elements. Well, I have traveled in the West extensively with the, with the Fazl of Allah. And this is a hidden agenda to take people away from the Aimma, to take them away from Taqlid. When Imam Shafi rahmatullahi came to visit the grave of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahumullah, he stood by the grave of Imam Sab. And it is his practice of Dwayat Qunud. In the Fajr Salah after Ruku, the teachings of Imam Shafi is to read the Qunud. But he said, in respect to the teachings of the dweller of this grave, I will omit the recitation of Dwayat Qunud because I'm standing on the land of a great scholar by the name of Nu'man ibn Thabit, Imam Abu Hanifa. Now look at the respect they had amongst themselves and then we create this respect. Allah Ta'ala favor us with respect on every level, on every platform, be it amongst ourselves, in our social standing with Allah, with Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah make respect a reality in our lives.